Good morning. Good to see all of you here, and thank you for joining us online. Last Christmas, we, um, we focused on Christmas by looking at some different birth announcements, and one of those birth announcements was about John the Baptist. And his parents received, particularly his father, received this, this word about John, that he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And then later in the Gospel of Luke, we read this. <clears throat> Jesus says to his disciples, who do the crowds say I am? What are, what's the buzz? What, what are people talking about? What are they saying? And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Now here's Elijah popping up again. Elijah, by the time of Jesus, Elijah was the man. He represented a, a, a righteous power that would stand up against the powers that be for what was right. And he was such a powerful image that he provided this comparative symbol for everybody. Now, think of it this way. <clears throat> if you were to talk about, well, how somebody, oh, they're a great basketball player. Well, how great are they? Well, they're, are they as good as Michael Jordan? Right? Because, you know, he's just become that big, that legendary, that people, well, he's not as good as that, or he's better than that, you know, that becomes that standard. UIU basketball fans, who's the coach? The coach that everybody else compares to? Bobby Knight, yeah. For decades, the Republicans were waiting for their next Ronald Reagan. Democrats waiting for their next Roosevelt or Kennedy, kind of depending on their age. You know, that's, we're waiting for that one. That someone that's just so powerful in the mind that, that it just holds a place there. That's Elijah. How, how great will John the Baptist be? He'll be like Elijah with his miracles and powerful teaching. Who do, be, who do people think that Jesus is? He's Elijah. And then we have this. Matthew 17, it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and then took them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and who? Elijah, talking with Jesus. Now, we get Moses. Moses is... The man, man, you know, he is, he is it. He's the deliverer of the Israelites out of Egypt. He is the, the lawgiver. Uh, he, he's that. So after him, who else would we pick? I mean, who else is going to show up here if representative of that? Here's Elijah. This is a guy that we need to kind of know about. Because in, in the time of Jesus, and probably up to that, he, he is just this powerful, powerful symbol. Well, why? How did he get to that place? Because we have this interesting thing. James says, in the letter of James, Elijah was a human being, just like us. A human being. He's not a superman. Well, who is he? Well, he's just a man of incredible faith, and we want to look at that today. So who exactly is he? Well, following Jeroboam, when last week we, we saw that the kingdom uh, split, and, and we have now two kingdoms of Israel. We have the southern two tribes making up Judah, and we have the northern, 10 northern tribes making up what would be referred to as Israel. A lot of the kings of Judah are bad, a few are good, that is, they follow after the Lord. All the kings of Israel are bad, are evil. And one of the worst of them was a guy by the name of Ahab. And not only did he con continue the idolatry that his predecessors had, he took it one step further by marrying the daughter of a priest of Baal. Now, her father was actually a king and a priest in Sidon, which is, was to their to the west, right along the coast. And you'd have these marriages to create alliances. And so she comes in. Her name is Jezebel. 
And given her lineage, she was committed to do two things. One, wiping out the worship of Yahweh, the worship of the Lord. And second, installing the worship of Baal and Asherah. Now, Baal was considered uh, the god of fertility. You, you needed him to make your crops grow. You needed him for your livestock, for your own household. And he was often pictured with lightning and thunder. And hang on to that thought because we'll need that here in a little bit. And it was believed about Baal that every winter he went to sleep. And so in the springtime, when it was time to start planting your harvest, you needed him to wake up. And the way that you got him to wake up, they would get a, a priest and a priestess, a man and a woman, and they would, they would go to a high place with a slab rock, and there they would have um, relations in front of all the people. And the idea was, their hope was that Baal would look at that and go, well, that gives me a thought. And he and Asher would get together, and by them getting together, then there's fertility. And then the people would gather around that and they'd all go, oh, okay, this looks interesting. And they'd go off and have sex with prostitutes themselves. So that's what you have going on. These people who have all these commands, all this stuff from the Lord, and they are going far away. And it, it doesn't just stop there. When things got really bad, there were real crisis, you would, they would take their firstborn and sacrifice them to Baal. This is nasty business. And it is so far away from what God intended. But unlike their predecessors, they didn't just introduce, introduce this idolatry or just allow it to exist. They enforced it. They made the people worship this way. And Jezebel would go on to a campaign to kill off as many of the prophets of Israel that she could. So into this scene of incredible immorality and death comes Elijah. 1 Kings 17.1 says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And we don't know a lot about Elijah, just where he came from. Uh, Tishba is on the other side, the eastern side of the Jordan River. And he just sort of shows up and he just sort of kind of walks in to take a stand for God. And what he says is there will be no rain, no mist, no fog, no dew, a complete drought until Elijah said otherwise. And with a long enough drought, what do you get? Famine. Things get very desperate. I like to imagine he kind of walked in very calmly, just out of work, kind of like a Clint Eastwood character. You know, there's a... Doo -doo 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 -doo. And he just comes in, and who is this guy? Nobody really knows who he is. And he says, guess what? It's not going to rain until I say it will rain. Kind of a... Mic drop moment, boom, and he's out of there. Now, what's so significant about this prophetic statement? It's simply this. Remember, Baal is the god of rain. They need Baal to rain, and what he's saying is, your Baal is nothing. Your Baal is nothing. And he essentially lays down this gauntlet and he's challenging the authority and thus the very existence of Baal. And that means he's challenging Ahab and Jezebel who have brought this false religion to the people. Now, what, what motivates him? What, what brings him into this moment? We're not told, though it can be inferred that he is sent by God, but we, we don't get that at this point. Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy. And you may remember in Deuteronomy, a lot of conditions are laid out, and basically the, the conditions of the covenant, which is if the people keep their focus and their trust on God, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever name you want to use there, they will keep their focus on him. He will bless them, take care of them, protect them, provide for them. But if they turn to false gods, there will be trouble. 
And so in Deuteronomy 28, 24, we read this, the, saying the Lord, if, if they wander away, the Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. Now, doesn't that sound like a dust storm? Absolutely. Why? If you don't have any rain, you get dust. You, that's what you're, you're going to get. You get these dust storms. So here's what we're doing. Let's go back to the full passage of James. And it says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. So who's this Elijah guy? This is a guy who believed God. He said, God made this promise, gave this warning, and the people have done the very thing God told them not to do, and so he believed that God would fulfill his promise. Then it says this, as the Lord, the God of his remembrance that lives, whom I serve. So not only believe God, he served God. He put himself into a position to be used by God. And so in a sense, Elijah is saying to Ahab, you serve a dead God, a non-existent God. I serve a God who is real. I serve a God who is alive. And God himself will prove the point. Now, after this proclamation, he, he walks and leaves, and he goes off to this valley, and he stays there and waits out the drought and the famine that follows. There's some other accounts that you could read there, one that gets referenced by Jesus about him taking care of a, a widow and bringing her son back to life. But we then read this. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. To do what? He's going to challenge the idolatry of his time on behalf of God. The idolatry that was around the people of Israel took a number of different forms, a number of different gods, but he, he's not challenging all of it. He's challenging this one particular God in this particular time, in this particular place, because that was the dominant force for them. And it's a reminder for us that all of us as followers of God, as follow Jesus, we will have to confront different issues in our time frame. And that's going to look a little bit different based on the challenge in front of us. So when he met with Ahab, he told him to bring all the people of Israel together. Now, probably not all of them showed up, but representatives from the, from the nation. And the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, whom Jezebel financially supported. Now, only the prophets of Baal show up. I don't know if Jezebel said, listen, I don't know. This could go, <laughs> not go our way, so let's kind of split our forces here and let's just keep back the priest of Asherah. Now, here's a question. Is, is he afraid? What, is, what does he know, Elijah? Well, in Psalm 115, we get this. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands, and they have mouths, but they cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear, noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel, feet, but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. What is he saying? You can, that their idols might look like human beings, might have some kind of, it might look like an animal, but they're nothing really at all. There's nothing to them. So then when everyone is gathered on Mount Carmel, said Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And we get this, this but the people said nothing. It's interesting you know, that we get that. They're just kind of like, huh, what do we do with this? Now remember, they've been forced to do that, but they've been going along with it. Then Elijah said to them, I am only the only one of the Lord's prophets left. At least that's what he thought. But Baal has 450 prophets. So it's me against these 450 others. And we kind of like those, those stories, don't we, where the underdog, the one, one person or small team goes up against a, a larger force. But he's saying, look, I don't have human power on my side. I have something else. So get two bowls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. 
Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. This time the people spoke up and they said, well, what you say is good. All right, we're up for this. This should be interesting. Now notice that he lets them, so he doesn't, he, he doesn't want to be accused of any kind of trickery. He doesn't have any, so you pick your bowl, you, you get things ready, and I'll do the same. So what's he doing here? He faces the priests of Baal all on his own. But he knows he's not alone. Because he has a living God on his sides. So the prophets of Baal, they do all that and they begin calling on Baal. From morning until noon. Just calling and praying and dancing around doing all sorts of stuff. Nothing happens. And at noon, we're told Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. So they shout aloud, and they begin to slash themselves with swords and spears until they bled. And that went on for the rest of the day, and still nothing happens. Finally, Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. It's my turn. And then he told the people, come closer. I want you to, I want you to see exactly what I do here. And he made an altar, and he took 12 stones one for each of the tribes of the descendants of Jacob. And he, he made an altar out of there. And he got the wood together. And then he put the bowl on top of that. And then he said, listen, I want you guys to fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. What do we know about wet wood? It doesn't burn very easy, right? And he has them repeat this, go through this. Three different times they do all this until the water has just drenched the sacrifice, drenched the wood, drenched all the stones. And it's even, he had them fill, put a trench around this and he had, it fills up the trench. Well, why is this? So that no one can say, Elijah started the fire. He, he had a big lighter and, you know, can't, can't be done. Something else is going to have to intervene here. So it's at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and he prayed. Simple little praise. No shouting. No cutting himself. Nothing like that. He said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and it burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also looked up the water in the trench. It was like a lightning bolt, just boom. Now, this is what they would have expected from Baal. They didn't get it. Because Baal doesn't exist except in people's minds. But the God who stands outside of his creation but interacts with it as well sends down and takes the sacrifice. Now, it says, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now, it's important that we get this, because wouldn't we love to just, you know, like go to Washington, D.C. or go somewhere and say, all right, I got 12 stones here, and I got a bowl, and I'm going to show all you people that God is real. He acted in terms that people would understand. It was a very specific occasion for his folks. Having a debate, giving a three-point message with an intro and a conclusion on each side of that isn't, isn't going to cut it. He does something that they can understand for their time. And in different times, in different places, we communicate who God is in ways that the people can understand. Elijah then had the prophets of Baal seized and put to death. And then Elijah begins to fervently pray the rain would come back. And he's praying and he's praying and he's got an assistant with him. He said, go look. He said, well, I've not seen anything. Keeps praying. They said, well, there's a little cloud about the size of a fist. And then it grows and it grows and it grows until there is just this downpour of rain. It says, the power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way down to Jezreel, which is where Ahab and Jezebel lived. 
And when Jezebel heard from Ahab what Elijah had done to her prophets, she sent word to him that she would have him killed. So Elijah ran for his life, and he despaired for his life. And finally he gets to a place, and he just collapses. And he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Something seems off, doesn't it? How do you go from just having this momentous conquest, this momentous victory, to the point where you're suicidal and depressed? Because he's human. He's a human being just as we are. What, what, what do we know about these kind of events? And, and, you know, the body and just gets all hyped up and, you know, there's all this adrenaline. And then when you have a high, high, what do you get next? A low, low. And that's where he's at. He's absolutely wiped out. And because he's wiped out, he can't see anything positive. And he fell asleep. Then it says twice... An angel Lord came and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank and he fell asleep and then he happened again. It says, this time strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So we see that he's just exhausted by these events because he's human. He's not superhuman. And then we're told he went into a cave and he spent the night and the Lord came to him. And here's an here's a interesting question. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? This moment, Elijah begins to have what he hadn't really had up until this moment, and that is a, a, an intimate encounter with God. Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. You hear the whine in the voice? What what does God do? He doesn't say, shut up, Elijah. Get your act together. Man up here, buddy. No. God let Elijah rest and then he let him vent. That's quite the spiritual thing. You know, sometimes we forget that one of the most spiritual things you can do is take a nap. If you're just worn out, if you're just in, just go take a nap. I've had over the years a number of people come into church and do the, that very spiritual thing and take a nap. <laughs> if I can give that gift to you, you're welcome. <laughs> Love blessing people. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to test by, pass by. Then a great, before he goes out there, it says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. That is some wind. That's hurricane plus winds. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. I want you to see this. God came in the unexpected. When there was the earthquake, I'm sure Elijah thought, okay, this is it. You know, strong wind, earthquake, fire. He's in one of these things. But no. It's in this gentle, gentle whisper. Then the voice said to him, here it is again. What are you doing here, Elijah? It's kind of, what are you looking for? What are you saying? What's going on? Tell me about your heart. Now, folks, you you, got to get this. Because... 
The people who worship Baal, and the people who've worshiped all sorts of, of different idols, even Roman and Greek gods, all that stuff, they did not have a God who cared about them. If you needed something, you, you'd offer some kind of sacrifice, some right, you, 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 you had to kind of get your prayers just right and say it just right, some kind of thing to get that God to act. But they didn't care. You're trying to get their attention. You're trying to get them to, to do something for you. But here, the Bible shows us as a God who comes in and who cares about his creation. Why else ask this question? He's saying, let's talk, Elijah. Speak what's in your heart. And so Elijah replies, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Just says it again. And God will say, listen, I got a job for you. He doesn't, he, he just says, okay, well, let me tell you what we're going to do. And then he tells him this, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. What Elijah discovered through this, he was not alone. He's given a mission. You, I've, I've got, he's told, I'm, I've got this person who's going to do this for me. You're going you're gonna to go and you're going to get Elisha and he's going to succeed you. There's stuff to do here. You're not on your own. I know you're hurting. I know you're frustrated. I know you're wore out. You're exhausted. And you can't see, because of that, you can't see all that's happened. You've totally forgotten about what just took place at Mount Carmel. But I'm telling you, I'm here. Your work's not done yet. But the good news is, you're not alone. Now here's what I want you to take away a little bit, not only under an understanding of Elijah, but I want you to get this too, that you can encounter God too. You and I can encounter God. We can have this. First, how does it happen? It begins with faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that faith has to exist for it. If you, if you really want to know God, you have to start with the belief that he is there. That ha that's the starting point. And then that encounter often follows action. We have this thing, listen, God, you do some stuff first and then I'll start <laughs> obeying you. Then I'll start following you. Then, then, then I'll go. You, you act first and then I'll do this. But what you see time and time again is that God meets us after we act, after we take that step of faith. We take a step for God and he comes to us. And that's, that's how we learn who he is and that's how we learn how to trust him. But keep in mind this, that encounter can happen in unexpected ways Unexpected, unexpected places. We go looking for the dramatic, for the wind, the earthquake, the fire. But I found oftentimes my encounters with God might be on a walk. It, it might happen when I'm reading something in God's word and, and just, it just pops out at me, oh, this, this is the thing I needed to hear today. It can happen when we take communion, when we're, we're quiet and we're still. It might happen when we're singing songs, but suddenly, suddenly everything just kind of lines up that message of that song or a verse that, you, that we covered and you go, oh, this, this is it, I see it, I see what God is trying to tell me. I see what he's trying to communicate to me. But we have to be willing to say, okay, I'm here. Folks, you need to know. I want you to just kind of think about the room. You don't have to turn your head all the way around. I'm going to stand up and do a 360, but you're not alone. As a church, we're not alone. There are people all over this world right now who are worshiping on this day. 
some in huge buildings, some in secret little things, some just a few of them in a room. They're worshiping. You're not alone. It may feel like it, but you're not. But I want you to know that the God of the universe has come to this world, and he did it in Jesus. He, God was Jesus. Jesus was God. And he came and he dwelt among us, lived among us, and then died for us. That you might know who he is, that he cares. During this time of communion we're about to take, I just invite you to just say, okay, God, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll see something this morning. Maybe it'll be tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday. Or, but I'm ready. I'm ready to act and I'm ready to hear. I'm ready to see the reality of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and a chance to be in your word and to learn from Elijah's life. Lord, we may never see fire coming down out of heaven and look up a whole sacrifice. We, we, We may never see anything that dramatic but we can know. As Jesus told Thomas after his resurrection, blessed are those who've not seen and still believe. Help us, Father, to listen to that still small voice, that whisper that comes through your word, comes with the Holy Spirit to say, see this, hear this, know this. May our hearts be open to that. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.